the barriers to entry on starting something these days, especially in the tech space, are so different. Um, you know, mm-hmm. when I started, you had to buy, you know, $10 million worth of servers and you had to, uh, so you had to raise a certain amount of money and you, you know, um, had to had to jump through lots of different hoops. And now, you know, with uh, the cloud technologies, it's just much easier to start. You could, it's much easier to start small and scale and you don't really have to worry about as much of that stuff in the background. <laughs> so Lisa, again thank you so much for this though i really appreciate it um like i think your background is really interesting it's going to really really help a lot of young professionals and we're going to get into all those details today as well as around some other kind of career aspects and delving into some of your work today so it's gonna be a lot of fun great excited to be here i want to ask you always the exact same question at the beginning is why do you do what you do you know i um i've been in the in the technology industry for I mean, longer than I can count at this point. And I think this is probably my last operating job. And so my criteria were a little different this time. Why I think why I do what I do is I was looking for one last thing at the end of my career where I could say, you know, it was, um, you know, it, my tombstone wasn't going to read. She sold a lot of software on the internet. It was going to have yeah. a little bit more meaning than that. And I think the company that I'm with has... Uh, a lot of ambitions around, um, you know, getting more diversity on boards and on leadership and um, really kind of purpose-driven company. And that just sort of made perfect sense to me as a, as a, you know, let's do one more. Yeah, of course. I feel like that where we are at the moment and kind of thinking in those different areas, about like leadership boards and stuff has, has adjusted like so much in the last couple of years. But of course, at this beginning of your year of your career, you were in Stanford, you were in Harvard, I feel like that, you know, tech was just kind of like staring at that point, you know, like Uh what were some of the kind of major kind of influences you had in your career direction? Because you got into places like Visa, places like Salesforce at a very early stage. Yeah. You know, my dad was one of the original techies. Um, He was a, a, a PhD in math and he was about four seconds from taking a teaching job at the university, one of the university of New York. So I would have been at a state university professor's daughter in upstate New York somewhere, which uh, for those of you in far flung places is like the middle of nowhere. And um, instead he took a job with IBM and moved out to California. So I grew up in Silicon Valley, grew up around it, had, you know, sort of a green screen computer that you had to code your own prompts on, um, you know, when I was very young, um, way before it was cool. And so I, I, I'm not an engineer, but I always grew up super comfortable around it. Um, and, you know, we didn't have a lot of stuff, especially early on. Um, I mean, my parents had were their first generation that went to college. Um, and you know, I went to a a public high school that didn't really have many resources. Like they didn't tell us about what was available to us. I think the only reason I applied to Stanford was because it was nearby. Um, and, um, you know, I only applied to three schools. They were all in California. Um, uh, I had no career counseling or no uh, college mm. counseling, but just said, you know, oh, I heard about this Stanford thing up the road, so I'm going to do that. Um, so that was really as, as simple as it was. I would say Harvard was more thought out. Um, and by that time I had gone through Stanford. I had lived internationally for three years. I moved to Mexico city after, uh, after Stanford. And, um, you know, I got into both Stanford and Harvard and had a long conversation with a, a couple of people around pros and cons and ultimately decided, um, you know, it was, uh, it was better for me to have a new opportunity and different exposure, a uh, different coast. And I, you know, I continued to really love the international work. Um, at that time, I'm not sure it's still true, but at that time, Harvard was a, was a stronger presence internationally and a stronger name internationally. So that was sort of what drove that one. Yeah, that's interesting because I suppose you could have went down like the academic route and it's very interesting. You, you were quite entrepreneurial and you also started your own company called Value Bond or were you uh-huh. one of the co-founders? Do you think that kind of mentality came out of university or were you kind of driven like that maybe possibly from your father? I, put you down that kind of I think it is, um, you know, I think most entre- uh, entrepreneurs are, uh, are born, not bred, if you will. Um, I, I think you're born with a bit of a hunger and a bit of a, um, a, a mindset, um, a, a challenge mindset and a, 
uh, you know, a willingness to try and a willingness to fail and a willingness to uh, seek big things. And um, I think, you know, you can, um, you can train people to be quite good at that. And uh, I think sometimes a lot of uh, what I would call sort of second generation entrepreneurs where, you know, you're coming into a company and helping them scale or, or things like that. Um, but it's a big leap when, uh, when you are starting something new and you're risking. And that's why the very young do it and the wealthy do it because um, the in-between is hard when you've got, you know, the kid and the mortgage and you say like, I wonder if I can just take a flyer and, uh, you know, try to try to start something. And if it doesn't work, well, that's fine. I'll just be homeless. You know, you get, it's much easier when you're, when you're in your twenties, you don't really have anything yet. And you say like, you know what, I'm going to try this. So, yeah. um, you know, I, but I do think that, um, it, it takes, it takes a certain amount of, um, of, of just confidence, both in yourself and in, um, you know, in the, in the notion that if you do fail, that, uh, that's okay. And you can go try something else. Yeah. I think it's the risk appetite as well that we see, you know, fade maybe as you go on. And I actually had a discussion with this like recently as well with my, with my partners, because like, you know, I'm young, 26 year old dude, very little, low, little, very little kind of like things holding me down from building my own business. And I have my agency, I have my consulting, I have an online business and I have nothing kind of holding me back from doing that. And I suppose like for the next couple of years, it's about kind of like plowing that narrative. And that's kind of why I'd like to kind of ask you around those questions as well, but like kind of you know, it's good to see how you've learned from those experiences and brought them into the corporate world, because I think that's a big thing that people can do. And what you said something very interesting about scaling other companies. A lot of people who join companies will be founders previously, sold mm -hmm. companies or failed companies. And I feel like, you know, was there a lot of lessons you think you took away from that that helped you move really quickly in the career aspect then? You know, I do think so. I, it's a couple of things. I think first, um, you know, Obviously, you start with a real passion for what you're doing and you throw yourself into it. And mm -hmm. there, there are plenty of people who are not entrepreneurs who do that as well. But I think it's particularly true of entrepreneurs and you're willing to do anything. You know, you're willing to take yeah. out the garbage. You're willing to fi figure out payroll. You're, you know, you're willing to, um, you know, help build the product if you have to. And, you know, how hard could this be? Like, I'll just, I'll just do marketing this week, you know? So, um, you know, I think you, you get a, first of all, you get a well-rounded, um, view of the world and you get outsized opportunities for, um, you know, for, for your stage in life, if you will. Like I was, you know, 28 years old when I, when I was a CEO for the first time, I had no business being a CEO. Like I had, I, I you know, I had marginally knew what I was doing, but you figure it out. And I mm -hmm. think, you know, it, when you, um, when you do that, um, first of all, you grow your confidence and your ability to do it. But secondly, you just get exposure that, um, that you, you know, you might not have had. So, you know, I think there's a lot of value to large companies straight out of school because there's really good training and really good structure and you learn the right way to do things. And that was really valuable for me. For example, when I left Harvard, I went to Bain and company and did strategy consulting and there was a right way to do it. And there was a structured way to think about how to define an industry and how to solve a problem and all that kind of stuff. But it was complemented by then leaving that and going into sort of jumping into the fire and going into, you know, like, let's just try some stuff and, uh, and see mm -hmm. if it works. And, you know, I think um, that can be a, a powerful combination. Um, but, you know, it's funny when, when people say, what should I do out of college? I really, it's, it's about your individual passion because um, I do think it can be really helpful to get a, um, a larger company on your resume, first of all, just for the credibility. So like if your startup thing fails, uh, and it ends up not working, you, you, you look employable. It's not some little tiny company that no one ever had, uh, you know, no one ever had heard of or, or, or knew what it was. Like you, you once worked for, you know, Accenture or McKinsey or whatever it was. Um, and you have that on your resume, but, but secondly, there's really good training in there. Um, so if you can, uh, you know, if you can, if you can do it, uh, I think that can make a lot of sense. Now there's a counter argument in here as well, that they will sort of beat the entrepreneurship out of you. And, you know, it's very <laughs> corporate and it's very straight down the like blade. So you gotta be a little careful with it, but, um, but I, I do think, you know, it really truly depends on the person and the opportunities presented to you. You know, if you don't get into one of those things and you have a great idea and you look at it and you say, there's an unmet market need, there's a, you know, a strong product fit, um, 
I know what, to you know, I have some either differential expertise that can meet it or can, can, um, can hook up with some people who do, uh, and, and exploit an opportunity. Um, and, you know, I don't have those other opportunities for whatever reason, then, you know, by all means, I think starting something can be incredibly interesting. And, you know, the, the, the barriers to entry on starting something these days, especially in the tech space, are so different. Um, you know, mm -hmm. when I started, you had to buy, you know, $10 million worth of servers and you had to, uh, so you had to raise a certain amount of money and you, you know, um, had to had to jump through lots of different hoops. And now, you know, with uh, the cloud technologies, it's just much easier to start. You could, it's much easier to start small and scale and you don't really have to worry about as much of that stuff in the background. So, you know, I think it's going to be, continue to be a really interesting time to be an entrepreneur. You, you do have, you know, kind of the monolith um, companies that are out there. And in some ways they do swallow up lots of technologies, but in, in other ways that creates an exit and um, it creates an opportunity for your idea to live on into the future. So I think it kind of depends on the lens you take to it. Definitely, of course. And it's it's all situational based because I, I laugh because I came from the big tech companies. I was in Accenture and I saw that possible you know element of conformity whereby it's like okay i have you know i'm on a decent amount of money i know how to solve a problem i'm working on these big projects whatever but for me there was always that kind of like respite i guess i'm always like i'm always just one inch away from restlessness so there's always something that i was always doing and like back then i was trying to grow a startup which involved me working 6 p.m to one o'clock in the morning and then i left there then after a couple of years and went to fintech which i'm in now and then i'm also growing out a startup as well so like you're getting that kind of combination but i suppose like those days did serve me really well because one i kind of realized I wanted something kind of different, but and I was able to identify that and I kind of like put it to bed. And I also got some really good training. Like I could understand like solving problems, user issues, speaking with people, conversational kind of stuff. Is just what these big companies can teach you. So it's 100%, yeah. so it's great. And I don't want to, you know, I don't want to um, discount those companies. Like there are people who stay in those companies for their careers and um, and they do amazing work and it's what they love. Um, you know, I, I think it's, uh, it really does sort of depend on, you know, what your mindset is around these things. And, you know, starting a company is incredibly hard and most of them fail. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's a, it's a, it's definitely a, a leap. Mm -hmm. So when you were in companies like Visa and Salesforce, you know, like even to this day, I can, I can see that you're, you're very like ambitious and, and like you're always seeking that kind of like top tier level of excellence. How did you kind of navigate through those companies to get into senior positions very young as well? I think in both of those companies, um, I was willing to do the work that nobody else was. Um, so I came in and um, in both cases, I came in in finance operations. And in finance operations, um, I fondly, with love, call it the armpit of finance. There's just a lot of stuff in there. There's, you know, finance and payroll and T&E and, um, and, and a lot of it is, is hard and easily broken, especially when you're in a company that's scaling. And people don't realize with Visa, I mean, Visa was growing at 20% a year at scale um, and it was the largest IPO in history when, uh, when I was there and um, continues to, to grow in good times and in bad times at 20, you know, almost 20% on the top line. So it's, it's a formidable company um, and, uh, and a growth company and a technology company. And I think a lot of people don't really put those things together. Um, mm -hmm. But when that happens, and when you grow 20% a year, you can do the math. In four plus years, you, uh, you've doubled the company. And you do that every four years, things break. And the processes that worked 10 years ago don't work, um, you know, anymore. And the processes that worked four years ago probably don't work anymore. So you have to constantly be reinventing yourself, your team, your processes. And um, so that was kind of what I did at both companies. Um, Salesforce was growing, you know, in the 30s when I got there and the 20s when I left, um, but had gone from a $3 billion company with 8,500 employees to a $27 billion company with 60,000 employees by the time I left. And you know, in that journey, uh, we reinvented ourselves multiple times. There are people who can come along for the ride for that and people who can't. So I think that's, mm. that's number one. You just have to have sort of a, a growth mindset and a flexibility that says, you know, I'm going to, uh, I'm just going to, I'm, I'm going to get into the stream and I'm going to go with the way the stream pushes me and not try to fight the stream, but I'm going to try to make it better. And, um, so I think that's number one. Number two is, as you know, going back to, um, I think they called me um, the Statue of Liberty at 
at um, at <laughs> Visa because it was um, there. The joke was bring me your tired masses uh, because I was always sort of taking on these uh, these broken toys and trying to fix them, and um, you know that worked out really well for me. So by the time I left, I had a couple thousand employees. I had um, you know I had all the finance operations stuff, uh, but then I had added real estate and um, that you know and that kind of thing. And then I think the other sort of tip here for people who are in big corporate jobs is I think you can always step back and um, add context and make yourself more relevant. And what I mean by that is, so one of the, one of the many things under me when I was in finance operations at both Salesforce and at um, Visa was procurement and procurement can either be really boring and uh, check the box and stamp the paper and push it across and say, look, look at me, I got your, your, purchase order done in less than three days, or it can be strategic and you can understand why the company is needing to buy this and mm -hmm. um, help get a better deal on it, negotiate that deal, um, talk to the business, let the business understand like, hey, I know you want to buy this thing, but this other thing is actually quite better. Um, let's have that conversation. And I think you can get to know people in the <clears throat> business um, in any role, even the depths of the back office, which is where I was. You can get to know people, you can get to know leaders, you can you can um, elevate yourself as strategic. And, uh, and that's basically what I did in both. So in both, I got opportunities about halfway through my 10 years in each one to, um, to move out of finance operation and move into the other side of the business. So in the visa example, um, I was approached by the CFO and he said, look, you, you do all these big deals for us. Uh, we don't actually have a you know, a partners and alliances group. I need someone to form a biz dev group. I want you to do that. And I said, mm. okay. Um, and so then I was off to the races doing partners and alliances, which I have subsequently done in every job that I've, that I've had, um, on the Salesforce side, it actually went down exactly the same way. I, um, had gotten to know Keith Block, who was the, uh, I call him the other CEO of, uh, of Salesforce at the time he was COO. And he called me up and he said, look, I need someone to come help me. I'm COO, but I'm kind of known as sales guy and I need someone to come run operations for me. Um, and you know, I, I, um, it was literally, that was the job description. Um, and I had no reports when I moved over, but I called a bunch of people and I said, what's it like working for this guy? Can I trust him? Mm -hmm. And they said, hundred percent, it will be the best experience of your career. You should do it. Take a leap of faith. So I said, okay, I'm going to do it. So I left my great job on the finance side, uh, working for the CFO of Salesforce. I moved over to work for Keith and I took on at that time sort of business development. And, uh, it ended up being, you know, I had, by the time I left, I had, uh, really sort of, I was, I was kind of his number two. Uh, I had all of his, like when he got the CEO position, I took on five of his direct reports. So I had, you know, partners and alliances and ISVs and enablement, global sales strategy, uh, the office of the CIO. Um, so I had a sort of a, a funky mix of internal fa uh, facing and external facing stuff, but it was really sort of a willingness to take things on and, um, and, and kind of fix some of the broken toys and, um, you know, uh, you know, no, no job was too dirty, um, for, for me to do. Yeah. It's interesting because like you could have stopped at a certain point, you know, like when you were in visa, you could have said, Oh, I'm not going to make the move to Salesforce at that point. I'm, you know, I'm making X amount. My family's happy. I'm, I'm, this is perfectly fine as it is. And that's where a lot of people would stop. And it's funny you mentioned about like, you know, you navigate your way around companies, you know, I've had some guys on my on my on my show who moved to front office sales from Morgan Stanley. They were a back office risk beforehand. They had uh -huh. never seen a trading desk in their life, and they didn't get there due to technical ability, anything like that. It was all just to do with their network and how they navigated their way around the company. And I think it even happened to, even to me, to be perfectly honest. Like I was in operations, and now I'm in front office product. So it was just about a combination of like, not necessarily like greasing palms, but like being able to deliver your message and show it out to people at the right time so that when you when the name comes up it's like who are we going to bring around we don't want to hire someone externally we can bring someone like lisa you know that kind of approach um and i suppose that's often overlooked isn't it like the trying yes. to really understand like the inner workings of companies so that you're actually like you know a, a situated well for these promotions these salary increases so that when it comes around you're not left disappointed 
Yeah, that's that's fair. Um, you know, the one thing I should probably correct is um, because I think there's another mini life lesson in there is when I got the call from Salesforce, I said like, you know what, I've done that job. I'm good. It was some tiny company that no one had ever heard of. I said, um, you know, no thanks. And uh, the recruiter was really, first of all, the recruiter was a relationship. So the recruiter was someone that had been at Visa and had gone to Salesforce. And the recruiter said, listen, like, how much could it hurt to know another CFO? Why don't you just come meet Graham? And he was the, the, the CFO at the time was a guy named Graham Smith. Um, and I went and had dinner with Graham and just loved him. Um, I thought, you know what, I can learn from this guy. Um, his, uh, you know, CPU speed was incredibly fast, just a very bright guy. And I said, um, you know, okay, this is actually, um, that was it. That was a job that I went to work for the person because I felt like I could learn from him. Um, so it, I viewed it actually in, in some ways as uh, taking a half step back because I was moving back into a corporate services role. Mm. I was going from the largest IPO in history to a company in San Francisco that no one had ever heard of. And, um, but I thought, you know what, I can learn and it will be fun. And, uh, and, and that worked out pretty well as well. Of course, you know, you look at those decisions and you make them very strategically, but what, how do you, how do you analyze these situations and how do you make an assessment on what you should do next when you're making these big changes? I think it depends a little bit on life phase, honestly. Um, you know, I think on the on the first half of of my career, it was about um, gaining skills and um, experiences. I, I cared less about the thing that I mentioned, which was you know working for someone uh, who I admired and could learn from. And in fact, I think some ways, you know, having a bad boss earlier in your career can actually be really informative. Um, and you can take it as a, you know, the glass is half full and say, I'm going to learn what not to do. I wouldn't say in a situation like that indefinitely, but it can certainly, you know, sort of shape, um, you know, the way that you treat your own team, the way that you, uh, you look at your own career when you, um, when you, you know, work with someone who you, you, you think less of. So in some ways I, I view those as opportunities as well. Um, but I would say it was about, it was about gaining skills and to a certain extent it was following passions. I think, you know, if it were just about gaining skills, I would have probably never left, um, I would have never left Bain and uh, doing strategy consulting um, because I was gaining a lot of skills there. But I looked down the hall at Bain. And so I guess there's a potential aspect to it as well. I looked down the hall at Bain and I, you know, I saw these partners and they weren't really doing work that was different than what I was working. And they didn't really have lives that were different than my life. They had a slightly larger office and a better car and, um, <laughs> you know, but they were on airplanes five days a week and, uh, and doing PowerPoint slides and leaving those PowerPoint slides with the customer, at, you know, at the time, literally a binder. Uh, now it would be a, you know, a, a thumb drive or something, but at the time, you know, leaving a binder with the, with the, the client and walking away and never knowing if it was implemented. So for me, that first big shift out of that was a, a passion for wanting to know that, you know, how the movie ended and uh, whether the, you know, whether the changes were made and if they were, how were they successful? And then thinking like, what if I just get, went and did the changes? So, um, so there's a little bit of that in there as well. But then I think later in your career, um, you know, first of all, there's more luxury of uh, being in a more senior position. I think you just have a little bit more leeway. It becomes a little bit more about, you know, working with people you enjoy, um, working on something that um, that drives your passion, um, working at a company of purpose that you feel like is contributing in a positive way. And I don't, you know, it, that doesn't have to be super broad. That can be a company that is, um, you know, it's it's hard to see where, uh, you know, where it contributes, but um, but they uh, they treat their employees incredibly well and make sure that they get the training they deserve and uh, and do you know socially responsible things, um, you know, in uh, in their community. So it, mm -hmm. it, I think that the definition of what that means to be a company of purpose is. I think different for everyone, but I do think that, you know, increasingly, I would say my generation, you know, less tuned into that, your generation, much more tuned into that. And, you know, it turns out to, I think, make a big difference. I, I completely agree. It's, it, it's crazy. The similarities that you're, that you're describing that I've had conversations with other people. So I've met people who are, you know, a couple of years older than me, 
that had they have a great reference to so there's one guy in particular who was on my show his name is Yusuf fantastic guy he was working for BlackRock investment banking mm-hmm. and he said that his assessment of you know where he should go in his career was what he looked at his boss and he looked at his boss's boss and he was like is that is he fundamentally happy and if I get to that stage would I be at that level of happiness and since then he went 180 into becoming a doctor went 180 into actually the fitness industry because that's where his interest always lied but I thought it was a good analogy and it was similar enough to what you described in the Bain experience about you know fundamentally it's just binders and and presentations and maybe that's not what you wanted to do 15 years from now as a partner Mm -hmm. so it's those kind of realizations and shifts which is very interesting and then you get onto the path of passion purpose and fulfillment which is literally baked into everything that I pretty much do you know and I think that feeds really well into your, your work at the moment because you've made that change deliberately and now you're working on something that's actually kind of hits that, that, that kind of trifecta effect. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I think, um, as I said, it was really important to me, um, in this role to make sure, um, that I gave back in some way. And, um, I've been very passionate about women in leadership. Um, you know, if you just look at the statistics, um, uh, in in most uh, industrialized countries, women graduate from university at a higher rate than men. So I think the argument that that you know oh there's no pipeline is is false. Um, I do think there is an argument that there is a a, a weaker pipeline in um, some of the areas that I have been in in sort of deep finance in um, in uh, technology in particular. And in some of the emerging technologies around, you know, AI, ML and, um, and things like that, you, you just, you don't see as many women. And I think that's a shame um, uh, because women in those fields actually do tend to do quite well. But um, taking that aside for a minute, as you see women go up through the pipeline, only 8% of women in the Fortune uh, 500 in the U.S. Are, uh, are female. And so what happens in that pipeline and how does that happen? Um, and I think that it is, um, there's a, there's a very early intervention that I'm just not qualified to solve for, which is education. And how do you create, um, truly equal opportunity for everyone? Cause at the end of the day, I think that's the right, um, you know, if there's a quality of opportunity, let everyone fight it out. I think I'm good with that. Um, mm-hmm. but if you have only, uh, you know, if you don't have any girls going into STEM because, um, you know, they're told, oh, girls aren't good at math or, or uh, math isn't cool, um, then, um, you know, then it, it, it skews the um, it skews the numbers coming out the other side and ultimately it skews the leadership in technology or in, in technology firms, in firms where, you know, being an engineer is of value. And so, um, so that is, you know, so I, I, it's hard for me to solve the education issue, although I try to pay attention to it and highlight it. But on the um, but on the women in leadership, I do think there's specific things that companies can do um, that I like to talk about. And it is, you know, just just look at yourself, like look at your look at your population, uh, particularly for people starting companies. If you um, if you start a company and the first 15 hires all look exactly alike and all went to the same university together, um, you know, that can be awesome for camaraderie and moving fast. Um, but it, it sets a it sets a, a difficult bar for becoming more diverse and bringing in other other thoughts. And you know, diversity can matter. Like you know, what you the you know the product idea that you dreamed up over six beers and you know in a basement somewhere, um, you know, and convinced yourself was amazing. Um, you know, may not be uh, may not be that great. And having someone you know with an outside lens being able to add a little bit more color to it, and being at a little bit more. Uh, by the way, I did do that. I, I uh, when I started Value Bond. And um, we, we brainstormed uh, at, at a, in a very late night about, about names of the company and came up with a couple <laughs> of terrible ideas, got out our credit card, bought the URL. And then the next morning we went like, yeah, it's terrible. Um, so, um, so, so in fact, that's a real life example, but in, you know, in any case, I do think, um, value bond is unique or, you know, was a, was a unique, uh, um, company in, uh, in, in that way. And that, you know, we started 50, 50 and the, and the company grew 50, 50. Um, I would say, you know, 
diligent to me is in a crossroads and in a really interesting opportunity and a really interesting area where, you know, we have 700,000 of the most important people in the world, you know, the C-suite and um, the boards of directors that are on our software every day. So who better to, um, to ask to identify the next generation of board leaders that are diverse? And it's, it's, it becomes very credible because, you know, I'm a sitting board member on Colgate Palmolive. And so I know what happens in a boardroom. I know what good looks like. I know what the skill set needed is. So who better than me to say, okay, I actually can look out into my network and I can say that person is ready and that person is ready. And let's like elevate them in a way that when a, a nominating committee comes around and is looking for people that they are at least in the mix. And that's, I think what, uh, what we've been trying to do. Yeah. It's interesting. Cause like there's a full, there's like a full career involved in that as well, you know, like changing like the leadership to be, you know, more evenly distributed and make sure that it's on equal power. It goes all the way back from the education. I know you said that you, you didn't know that much about like like the changing element of it, but it's interesting though, isn't it? Because like, I don't know what it's like in the States, but but in Ireland in particular, I know kind of what it's like in the States, it's a small bit, but like in Ireland, you know, you do your exams, kind of like your SATs, and then you go to university. And I did... Uh, a variation of engineering, let's call it that, as my as my undergrad, and there probably was thirty five percent female, and then it was funny out of that, out of that thirty five percent, they were definitely scoring higher than males. That's why it was interesting, but I wonder, is there something in like the marketing of it that I know you're saying about like, oh, you know, Matt's not cool, but is there something that that could be done to improve, like let's say pulling in more females into these these tech courses maybe it could be the appeal of like how much you can make as an engineer like um, engineers in america come out at two hundred thousand dollars at a university some of them so is, is there something like that at, at the core you know like and how you is know, that I, framed i do think that's why it's so important the um you know this notion if you can see it you can be it and to have um have you know have a nurture and retain uh, female leadership that, you know, girls can look up to and say like, oh, I could do that. If she could do it, I could do it. Um, it's mm. hard when, when you can't see yourself, um, you know, uh, it, you know, in, in, in senior areas of the company. And so I think that is one thing. I think the other thing is, you know, let's keep the 30% in the pipeline. Let's not let them drop off. And that means things like, um, you know, thinking through, um, maternity policies. And, um, you know, I know Europe is much better than the United States on this. Um, but it's still, you know, almost having outreach to women after they have children. And, you know, many of us do, um, you know, I know women who have amazing careers and have five children. Um, and, but they had companies that accommodated that and saw them as valuable resources. And in fact, maybe even more valuable resources, any woman that can have five children and manage that house, uh, and, and have a job, like I want to hire her, um, because, <laughs> because she's an expert at project management. Um, but, um, you know, I think it is, you know, as we look at our employee base, so let's just say the 30% comes in. Then are those are those thirty percent? When we do promotions, are we promoting at least thirty percent, or are the women getting promoted at, at a slower rate? When we look mm -hmm. at attrition, is the attrition higher than thirty percent uh, female? Because if it is, then our TAM or our install base is changing, right? When we hire, are we hiring better than thirty percent? Because that would be moving the needle in the positive way. And so I think, like you know, I, I tend to be very data driven, and I tend to say like the numbers will tell all. And if we if we look at them and we examine them and we examine them more than once a year as a snapshot to say you know how are we doing um, and how should we be doing? And I don't think that um, you know it's probably not realistic to say next year we're going to hire hundred percent female engineers because we want to have a, a you know a more uh you know we want to have more diversity in our engineering department and by the way there's thousands of reasons why that's a good idea particularly in, in places where half of your consumers or more are are female like you know there's there's myriad examples with from you know light switches to the size of an iphone to you know everything else on um you know why diversity matters in product development um, mm -hmm. but let's just say that was a goal it would be almost impossible to do because uh if if females are graduating uh you know at at you know less than 50 percent of an engineering class uh then you know you've got to over 
ever rotate so far to get those that it would just it would be prohibitively difficult. So and potentially not fair to some of the male hires that you would be, you know, like very qualified people that you know you would want in your business. So, you yeah. know, I think you have to um you have to look at it differently. Um that is why, you know, I say like think focus on the retain the retention, focus on the hiring, focus on making the workplace a place where um you know everyone's voice, the women, the men, um, the people of color, the um LGBTQ um, have uh, feel comfortable and feel like there is a place for them. And when you do that, um, you know, then you get uh, people raising their hand and asking the right questions and contributing to the conversation in a way that I think makes the company better. Yeah, it, make, it makes a lot of sense. Like, do you think, what do you think the ambition is mainly from female, female employees? Do you think that, you know, they're going to always want to push on to become again the senior roles that they want to keep on pushing that because you know at the moment the way it's kind of geared is like the way you're saying there is like oh people say they want to drop off after having pregnancies which is not the case you know but how do we position in such a way that people want to come back to the workforce and they want to get back into those senior roles well, I think we have to make it attractive. Um, we have mm -hmm. to make it, um, you know, in, in flexible in some ways. And I think in some ways the, you know, the pandemic disproportionately hit women because um, there, you know, there were childcare issues during the pandemic. However, the flexibility coming out of the pandemic could prove to be, um, you know, super helpful for women in that, you know, if you, while your child is an infant, want to work from home, um, then potentially that's more available than it used to be to, uh, in many parts of the world world to, um, to women. So, you know, I wouldn't want to paint it all with one picture. I think everyone is different. Um, you know, in my, um, when I was running finance operations in various parts, you know, you would have people who were what I would call lifer finance operations and, they were really good at processing transactions and um, they had deep domain expertise. They, you know, they remembered the time 15 years ago that there was fraud when, you know, such and such happened. Those people are incredibly valuable. They may not want to be lead the company. They may not want to, you know, get promoted every year. Um, and then you have kind of like the movers and the shakers and the hustlers. You have to figure out how like every six months they're raising their hand going, you know, like give me more, give me more. And then everything in between. So I think, you know, you know, the women are, uh, are different. Um, I think we can paint, um, you know, we can paint, uh, you know, groups with, with one, with one paintbrush and say like, Oh, you know, all women want to get promoted and all women want to come back after they have babies. That might not be true. Um, but I think making sure that we have the, the possibility for them and, um, we, you know, I think we can create a company where talent is appreciated and supported and um and women have the flexibility to take that time to go have a child and come back and it isn't um you know it isn't catastrophic to a career if you feel like um you know you come back into the workplace and all the money that you make is going to child care and your, you know, your, you've been, your career has been set back five years. I think that can be really, really difficult. And, you know, I was lucky enough to, um, you know, have a child when I was, uh, you know, super old. <laughs> And so, not that old, not that I, old. <laughs> I no, I literally was the most senior woman and the old. I think the oldest woman, but certainly the most senior woman <laughs> at Visa who had ever, uh, who had ever had a baby. And I was waddling around, you know, as an SVP uh, for you know, and and it was it was I. But I was in a position of power, and I was in a position to uh, not be afraid that um, you know, I, like what I would do. Um, you know, when I, when I, when I came back and I was in, and, and I used it by the way, I, mm -hmm. um, I was very visible with saying, I actually have to go now. Like my nanny has a hard stop and I need to leave the office. And I felt like that created runway for people. And I think it's really important, uh, whether, you know, not just for women, but for any manager, um, you know, if you, you know, if you, if you, you know, someday you're going to have a family, if you have kids, no, leave the office. I got to get to the soccer game. Um, and don't leave your jacket on the back of the chair and the computer open. Um, so people think you're still there, just go and say, this is, this is my priority and this is important for me. And this will make me a better worker because I'm going to be loyal to this company for providing the flexibility that I can go and do this and, and do something that's meaningful to me. 
That's a very interesting point because I think even when I used to work in the office pre-COVID time, there was always that feeling that you had to prove something to be able to do something like that. And I can't even I can't even imagine to think what it must feel like if you're a female, you have a kid and, you know, you want to be with that kid, you want to support them in some way. And then you have that other overarching element of the watchdog. But now, you know, I'm fully remote. Like I work completely, completely from my laptop. I get my work done. Sometimes I go for a walk in the evening, in the morning, as we discussed beforehand, you know, I take calls at night, take them in the morning. So it's a different dynamic. And I feel like the younger generation coming through here may have that better approach a hundred percent you do. Can, and it's not know, just kids, by the way, it's, it's, um, everything, you know, it's sports or life or friends or family, uh, or, or whatever. And I think that you all have done a much better job of creating space for that and saying, you know, my work is incredibly important to me. I am passionate about this job. I am loyal, but I have a life and I have, um, you know, this is a component of me. It is not me. And I have all mm. these other things that I bring to the table and nurturing those other things makes me a better person, ultimately makes me a better worker. 100%. And I think even the element of people having like side projects or side jobs or or like side, pro or like side hustles, it's funny because people always say to me, they're like, you know, is your company okay with you having like your own like thing on the site? I'm like, yeah, because... I've never missed a meeting. I've never missed a target. I've never missed anything. I'm never like doing something stupid. You know what I do in at the weekends or whatever has absolutely nothing to do with, 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 with my regular day job, providing I get it done. Does that make right. sense? Is obviously that caveat, but it's interesting because like, I don't know, it's weird. Like if I was out, you know, drinking and partying, no one would say anything, but when you're building something that's interesting to you, it's a different, it's like you get judged for it. Does that make sense? It's and a good uh, point. It's all a different. really good point. Yeah. You know, it, it's weird, like, as in, like, as, as a result of just, you know, the things that I do, I, I don't drink alcohol anymore, for instance. And instead, I feel myself much more focused and I can do much more, more things. And it's like, just because I can add more to this bucket does not necessarily negate my devotion and commitment and interest towards my career. Yeah, so I think way, it makes perfect it. sense. And I actually do think that the pandemic kind of helped with mindset around this a little bit. Mm -hmm. I will, I will out myself as being a little bit skeptical of, of folks that work from home. Like, are they really putting in the full day and um, you know, or are they, you know, going grocery shopping and getting the laundry done and, and uh, picking up the kids from school. And what I realized out of it was you like, absolutely. Yeah, they're doing all those things. They have an extra two hours in every day because they're not commuting. And so um, you know, have at it, um, you know, yeah. it's all good. <laughs> so, you know, I think it's um, I, you know, I think there are, you know, life lessons in there around. And I think you rightly point out, like nobody has an issue with, uh, with socializing. I think the, um, you know, the, the side hustle is alive and well. And I think as you know, most companies have, you know, kind of codes of conduct where, you know, if it's in conflict with your job, then that's obviously an mm. issue. Um, but if it is something that's just truly really a passion project on the side, I mean, why is doing a podcast any different than gardening? Um, you know, exactly. Just, just chatting with someone that's on the internet. That's that's what I put it. There at you the go. Day, yeah, you know? wasting time on video games. <laughs> <laughs> it's a modern day version. That's super, super interesting. I uh, no, I completely agree. Completely agree. I don't want to run over your time too much. So I know you're very, you're very limited. But the last thing I want to ask you is, how can someone, male or female, move as fast as you can? I think just be willing to, um, willing to stretch and willing to do the work. And I would say, um, you know, maybe I'll continue on uh, women in leadership uh, a little bit longer and say, you know, two things. Um, there's, there's, pl there's plenty of data that says, um, you know, given a, a given job description, uh, men will apply when they have about 60% of it. Women will apply when they have 100% of it. Um, uh, and then similarly from the other side, um, when, uh, when looking at uh, candidates for, uh, for uh, you know, new roles, uh, men tend to be judged on their potential and women tend to be judged on uh, their performance or their past performance. And so I would say if you are, um, you know, if, if particularly if, um, 
if you are, are female, um, you know, raise your hand, uh, be willing to stretch. Um, but I think for anyone and this, you know, it, it applies equally well to men, um, you know, try new things and especially early in your career, um, getting, um, don't be afraid to move laterally and don't be that person that always has to have like, well, I'm not going to do it because it is, um, you know, it's not a better title or I'm not going to do it because, you know, it's kind of lateral. I mean, I moved, I moved three and a half steps backward going from Visa to Salesforce. It was the best thing I ever did. And so, and it created more runway. So think about not just, you know, think strategically, think, um, think chess, think like not, not what's not, what's my move today, but how does that open up the board for me? And where does that let me go? Um, and if it opens up your optionality and the aperture gets bigger, um, then maybe it's a good move, even if it is, um, and, and, you know, even if it is technically a smaller job, or maybe it's even less interesting intellectually to you, but it creates more opportunity. Um, so I think it's that, it's that mindset of being, of being open, of having a growth mindset and a learning mindset and being willing to, um, being willing to be flexible that can really serve you well. Completely agree. Lisa, I'd like to say a massive thank you. I'd love to do many more sessions in the future. Open up a two hour window next time and we can get into much more detail. Well, when I, I, I usually get to Singapore every once in a while. I haven't been in a while. So when I get to Singapore, we'll do a live version or something. I have my own studio here, would you believe? I have my own rented studio. So it's a, it's all professionally done. I'll send you on even a couple of examples of it based Perfect. in Singapore. So I'd love to. I was thinking you would do it from the boat thing on top of the hotels. Oh, <laughs> we can do that as well on <laughs> Marina Bay. But uh, thank you so much.